like they come at you like, oh, it's for a Marvel movie, it's for this, it's for that. I'm like, damn. You could create a job and be the boy. That, that's true too, exactly. <laughs> so Tell your mom that one. Well, I don't like it. I'd rather just lay in bed and watch TikTok than do anything else. Welcome everybody. This is the first episode of KNS Creators Collective. We're here with Jimmy DeResta. What we're doing is exploring the creators behind their creations. Jimmy has over 20 years of television experience as well as his show Making Fun on Netflix and then about 2 million subscribers on YouTube with over 300 million views. We're going to get to know you more. Um, the viewers are going to get to know you more. Obviously if they're watching for the first time, you may not know who Jimmy is. Many of you do. We're going to do a little bit of everything today. So a lot to look at. And this is the famous shop that we've seen on so many videos, so. This is the shop we just used for the Netflix show, which we filmed exactly one year ago this last couple of weeks. So this shop has always been a dream of mine, and if you've been a fan from like back in the day, I've been on YouTube now for about 11 years, but I already owned this house when I started my YouTube channel. This house has always kind of been around since 2004. And I started my YouTube channel, some people mistakenly think that I got like rich and famous on YouTube and bought a house and got a young girlfriend. I had both of those before I started <laughs> YouTube. So I was able to get that on just my personality. But I had the house and the house never really had a barn and having the barn was always something that I wanted. So we started the building in 2017 and R&R &R Buildings built the initial building itself. And R&R &R Buildings, is Kyle Stumpenhorst, he's an amazing maker in Illinois. He took the opportunity to build the envelope for this building and make his first 15 vlog style videos in a row one a day, so he's got a great series about the very beginning of this building in October of 2017. Kyle built the building and David the Mexican Carpenter, that's how you can find him on Instagram, <laughs> and his team did the floor, then they did the exterior walls, Every all my friends chipped in, we did the insulation, and then uh, a small crew from East Durham did the interior just before we started the television show over a year and a half ago. Who did the stained glass? Oh, I did the big I was, resin. I was, I was like, it had to be you. Yeah, I did those for Total Boat, just to demonstrate the Total Boat resin. I, I did an advertising for a clip art company years ago, and they said, you know, go through all clip art, do something. So I made that branded logo, and it just kind of stuck. And I give, it, I, I give it out to fans and they cut it out. It's not necessarily me, it's just sort of a representation yeah. of the maker. So yeah, this is a dream come true and with the fans and the YouTube channel, it really came to life. I know you started with your dad initially, that was like your exposure to mm -hmm. all of this. Yeah. But like, was there a certain moment in time where it was like, okay, this is what I wanna do for my entire future. Like, where did that leap kind of come in? To be like, perfectly honest, I, I never had to make that decision. It was kind of pre made for you. predestined. Yeah. I was predestined to do what I do, and it sounds a little grandiose, but I never did anything but what I do now. Ever since yeah. I was a child, like a lot of the maker movement has created, and it's great. And I'm not taking anything away from somebody that did financing, like you, for yeah. instance, and now builds boats, or did financing and now built interior design, or like Kyle Stumpenhorst, went to school for business. Now he builds ten buildings a year, yep. incredibly well, incredibly styled. I started out in my dad's shop as a tinkerer, making things and cutting out letters. And as I got older, I just kept going from one maker freelance job to another. So in high school, I spent three years at architecture school thinking I was gonna go right into college as an architect. There was all this math involved and there's all this engineering. Uh, and, and you know, I was kind of more of a freestyle guy. Yeah. So I took time off from, from going to college and ultimately through some yeah. relationships and some friends, I decided to go to the School of Visual Arts. And where you taught, right? And that's where I ultimately taught, yeah. So I, went, I checked into the School of Visual Arts in 86. Stayed there till 90, and then I started teaching there in 93. Are you still teaching? 2017. There? I quit 2018. I quit teaching. Okay. To come up here full time. It was a great experience. I yeah. made lots of friends and I got inspired, and it really set me up to develop the freedom to, to know what I really wanted as an artist. Yeah, for the most part, most of my students didn't know who I was. But then as they got to know me, they would kind of look me up and then they would slowly develop like a fandom for me. Right. But it was more of a teacher-student relationship to begin with, so that was better. Yeah. I would, I would prefer that they not know who I am when they come in. Well, it, it, you, your expectations stay focused on what yeah. you're, because it's better for everybody. You get to teach and do yeah. what you need to do. Did you, you miss that, like, at all, like the teaching side of it? Uh, you know, not really. Not really. Only because, no, no like disrespect to you two guys. How old are you? I'm 33, he's 23. Yeah, that's all youth right there. No, not, like I said, no disrespect to you two guys and your ageism, yeah. but 
The younger generation that was coming through my class just had less and less respect for craft and less and less respect for working hard and less and less respect for even themselves. Like, they would just be like, oh, I tried that, I don't like it. Mm. I'm like, okay, well, now that's the only thing you have to do. Well, I don't like it. I'd rather just lay in bed and watch TikTok than do anything else. I've scoured a lot of like the web. One of the things I, I picked up was Rise of the Makers. Um, and so one of the things like, that stood out to me was you said uh, making things and like tools stopped in the 80s and then eventually it's made this like roaring comeback. Yeah. Like, what happened? When I was growing up, we took shop class yeah. and there was a big emphasis on working with your hands. There was, when I went to school, we went to a thing called BOCES. So you'd spend half the day in BOCES. You'd either learn how to work on automobiles. you you work with your hands. I could tell it was phasing out because of all the students in my high school, there was like 10 of us that would go to that. And the rest would, were going to learn how to do college stuff, like finance stuff. Yep. And then as time went on, I think more and more people that chose finance or a more white collar lifestyle would see people like me and be like, I want to try and get my, and a lot of, a lot of times you, you meet guys and they, they're so, they're embarrassed that they're helpless. But yeah. I think, but with Make Magazine doing the Make yep. Affairs, and then what really helped fuel the fire that they kind of sparked was YouTube. I met Make Magazine in 2011, and then- Oh, so it was that late, okay. Yeah, so shortly after I started doing YouTube, like within that year, and I didn't start doing YouTube because of Make Magazine, I started doing YouTube is it Discovery? Uh, because of the Discovery show that yeah. had been canceled. We did a show on Discovery and it was frustrating not being in charge of your own creative outlets. Yeah, that's good to know. Cause yeah, I, th I thought I even heard on the, the podcast, you're like, it was a way to get back at Discovery. Be like, I'll show them. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, they don't care. They're like a well, giant behemoth. They're like a big giant lizard. They don't care about it. But you had the chip on your shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but like I basically said, I'm going to go to YouTube and I'm going to do this without their help. And without anybody's help, I'll do it completely and alone and show that, you know, stripped down pure entertainment, voyeuristic entertainment is what the fans really, really want. <laughs> they don't want these, you know, stop action interviews. I mean, I really don't think it, I personally, as a maker, I just want to see people make stuff. Yeah. So I just wanted to create what I wanted to see. And at the same time, a lot of other guys kind of got the same vibe. And I think the catalyst above all of it was YouTube. Me as a maker on YouTube, I meet production companies and they're like, like, Oh, how's YouTube going for you? I go, it's going a lot better than what you're offering me for TV. I mean, I make more money in like three videos than I made for four months worth of work on making fun. I had a big argument. Well, it wasn't an argument, it was a one-sided me ranting to the production company. And I said, I go, I want to get paid what the garbage company gets paid. The company that drops the dumpster off. Yeah. I want to get paid what they're getting paid because I'm sure I'm getting, they're getting paid more than me. The, the production companies and the networks don't treat talent very well. I will probably never meet anybody at Netflix. The show is published, so I'm all paid and done. I'll never make another dime off that show. You, you will make the money people think you'll make if you see season four and five. Yeah. Like right now, Stranger Things is in whatever season four they're in and, five, and everybody yeah. looks like odd, weird adults. They're making a lot of money. When the show has to go to the, that's when the talent can basically say, I'm not showing up. And they go, well, how about this? And you go, nope. How about this? Well, maybe. I'll yeah, you have leverage this? at that point because <laughs> now you've created this beast. Yeah. That Season one, they're like, oh, everybody's being difficult. Yeah. Let's just cut the show. All right, Jimmy, for this next segment, we like to call this Scan the Gram. So this is a Instagram picture of you with very little context. Um, I want you to take me back if you remember where it was and what is going on here. I know a little bit about it, but that is you. That's um, me. I know exactly when that is. That's me in like 1990, uh, sitting on the floor of my dad's house. So this guitar uh, is, is made for Stefan Flam, who has a band called Winter at the time. He has a band called Meltdown, and he's still... He's, I think he has a deal with the devil because he's 53 years old. He looks like he's 25. Long hair, still looks like a rock and roll lead singer, crazy. And Stefan's a very active musician, still at it. And he still has that guitar. He showed it to me. If you go back and look at some video of me, uh, like from exactly, like when, right when the pandemic started, I did a guitar for him just recently. So that's in 1990s. How many years ago was that? 30 years ago? 32. 32 years ago, two years ago, I made him another guitar. My dad has been, is a very creative person, but he's also very timid. Yeah. I learned a lot from my dad about how not to do certain things and how to do certain things. Yeah. My dad had That's lots, of, yeah, my dad had lots of chances in life and 
he always took the safe choice. And me and my brothers and my sister, we rebelled. We most often took the, the non-safe choice. It's more adventurous to take the non-safe choice. And I've always taken the non-safe choice. I, I agree with that too, because my mom was always like, you go get a job and be the boss. And it's like, well, ma, I don't know if that's what I want to do. Like, You can create a job and be the boss. That, that's true too, exactly. So, <laughs> Tell your mom that one. So many people live in fear of taxes, of going broke, of credit cards, of all this stuff. Right. And that's a lot of things my dad was always trying to instill fear, not consciously, but unconsciously. Right. Oh, you got to get a civil service job. What if this doesn't work out? Why would you buy a house? What if you can't afford it? What if the and I stopped, I kind of made a conscious decision, not saying I never worry about stuff, yeah. but I try not to let anybody else's fears become mine. And that's where you always got to have like the dreamer's mentality, because it's yeah. like, look, you know, look, you know, everything that you've been able to do just came from taking that chance. Yeah. And yeah, there are some people, but there's always- And I'm still always taking like, chances. Yeah. I'm not, I mean, I haven't completely arrived. I still have to pay for all this stuff. So, yeah, this is cool because we uh, we saw this a little bit earlier. Yeah. The uh, blacksmith part of this, and then on the inside, I know I saw some goodies as well. So the, a funny story about the blacksmith shop, which is fully functional, and occasionally I come out, I, I don't come out here as often as I'd like to, but the blacksmith shop was a manifestation of my girlfriend saying, we need to do a class for blacksmiths. We met a blacksmith, his name is uh, Rory Smith. He's a very talented blacksmith. And uh, so we met Rory and we had Rory come and teach two blacksmithing classes. And they were super successful and they were a lot of fun and kind of set us up to do more stuff. We ended up doing welding classes. We'd done several classes up until the blacksmithing class, but it was really the first class where we needed a lot of equipment. Yeah. And so we booked the class, sold all the spaces in the class, and then I built the blacksmith shop. <laughs> Here's like one of the latest things I made. It's a knot tied in a railroad yeah. spike. And these, like a, occasionally there's something that I really need to make and by doing stuff like that, it's me just practicing and exercising. But when I really need to make something, those exercises have taught me. Yep. And this is a crazy old power hammer, which I restored a few years ago, which reminds me I have to call somebody. <laughs> Come on, give me some. Come on. Come on. Give it to me. There we go. Wild. This is so cool. Made in 1900. So like how important do you think like technology is? Because you mentioned earlier that kind of all this started with YouTube with you know the like the rise of makers and yeah it's from that like but how important is technology and like you know you have your camera that you showed us like what is is that playing like one of the biggest roles in this well te resurgence? technology has made life a lot easier for someone who wants to get into the maker business for instance a laser cutter which 10 years ago seemed like getting on a spaceship it was saying like yeah it was the complications of actually owning a laser cutter and you know the ramifications of using it safely or in, inaccurately, that's all now out the window because everything's been made more consumer user friendly, yep. laser cutters, CNC machines, and those type of things, it makes it entry level a lot easier. You know, makes it open to the masses in a way. 3D printing, because- 3D printing is another big one. Yeah. You know, there's guys that never actually physically use the table saw, but can really cool, make really cool objects on a 3D printer. You mentioned like there's people out there that have already been creating and making and doing things for you know 20 30 years but they haven't necessarily come into the the content creation side like on youtube yeah. like do you think people are like apprehensive sometimes like oh i don't know how to do you know editing or stuff like that or they yeah. they, they feel like they need a produced video but like how would you say like would, do you need a produced no oh, yeah there's a lot of guys that just do one takes and those yep. one takes are as charming and as likable and as watchable as somebody that has a production company. In some cases, they're even more digestible because they're a little unpredictable. Yeah. They're more fun, more entertaining because you're watching somebody that's learning. So you're watching them learn, which is intriguing. And you're watching them do something that they haven't been taught to do. So they're gonna do something that's almost in many cases even more interesting and more creative. Yeah, and there's a realness, I think. It's just like, you're an expert in, in many things, but you're also admittedly, you'll say, I'm an amateur this yeah. and this. And it's like, that's sometimes just what people need is they need to know that their heroes aren't 
they're not they don't have every yeah. single thing figured out but yeah. they're trying and yeah. that's that's the battle yeah that's it i yeah. mean i think i say it all the time if you want to do what we do as far as content creation you got to just start there's no yep project that's going to be the golden door there's no video process and there's no camera there's no editing software that's the golden door you just have to start like people wait around for the spark of inspiration to do the it. hit yeah it's not going to come it's not going to come without work you right. know I, I always say you got to work for the breakthroughs the breakthroughs are going to come while you're in the process of working for the breakthrough they're not going to come while you just granted you'll get the breakthrough while you're sitting in the tub <laughs> after you have 30 videos behind you yeah you're not gonna get it if you haven't started you still get nervous when posting videos sure is that still a thing like you are yeah you, and like what's behind that is it just my the... heart races a little bit it's almost like standing naked in front of the, the <laughs> audience it's like you're like oh, all right hit publish like I know you've mentioned you like more of like the rustic look not yeah. like a super polished so like yeah it's cool when you just see stuff like lying yeah those around. I like any any s spoke flywheels I always grab. I never know what I'm going to use them for, but yeah. they're always good to have. This is the machine shop. I call this the machine shop because when I first came up here, this is where I started collecting the machines that I Ooh. use. So yeah, like what percentage of your business now like comes from YouTube as opposed to commissions? Do you, are, is like the majority of your work coming from YouTube or is the majority of well, your Well, I try and make everything that I do become somewhat of a YouTube content because what I'm building now is I, I'm focusing on building my library. If it looks like a cool video and there's lots of cool techniques that I can combine together, I'll be like, I'll make it a long form video. Yeah. Or I'll take the project because I can make a good video out of it. YouTube is, is like the head of the octopus is what I like yeah. to say. And anything I could funnel through there in all at the same time creating my library, adding to my library of, fil of films. Because then those library, those films in the library could then ultimately be licensed out to Roku or this one or that one absolutely or and that that all kind of plays in with the whole you know Netflix aspect as well it's like yeah so how did that come about because did, like I know you mentioned you you haven't even spoken to Netflix so like, Netflix started December of 2007 me and Derek Graz Pat and Jackman got together at the YouTube studio in New York City to shoot Jackman's 100,000th subscriber celebration oh, video. We took a couple of stills of us sitting in a big giant chair that Jackman made, a big giant Adirondack chair. And so that still image of all of us sitting in the Adirondack chair floated around on Reddit. And a talent agent looking, a talent scout for intuitive entertainment saw that picture and reached out to Jackman. This show just kind of materialized. We're all just big kids playing with expensive toys. And that's what's cool too, because it's like one part I love about the show it's actually the endings. So like you do all these callbacks to um, movies. Oh yeah, so there's we, like tried e. do, <laughs> we tried to do, they were gonna actually, we were running out of time. So the producers put all the endings on hold, but they wrote Spielberg endings to several of the oh, episodes. Sp it was Spielberg, it was Jurassic Spielberg Park, E.T. E. Yeah, and unfortunately we weren't able to, and, and Back to the Future. So we had yes. five more to do, but we couldn't get it together again. So cool thing, I know we were talking about movies a second ago. Your favorite movies I heard you say, or at least maybe as a kid, Willy Wonka, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. That's right. So do you have any like, have you done anything in the past or have you, do you have like a love of like set design or like movies? I know you didn't really like toy making, but like there's so many other things that you can do with that in like movies. Is that something you've done or want to do? Well, I always thought about doing a long form feature movie. That would be fun. Yeah. But I see how much it just takes up everyone's life. Like for instance, Casey Neistat is a good example. Casey has done long form movies, but he's been able to make more money than any filmmaker just doing what he enjoys doing, dipping in, doing a video about surfing, dipping in, doing a video about a new jacket he bought, you know, <laughs> and he's creating his whole life as a one long form movie. Exactly. And he doesn't have to deal with producers, editors. But even, uh, were you, have you ever been like commissioned to do anything for movies, like, you know, especially since I, where some of your inspiration came from is like those types of movies. You mean like inspiration as far as like, I mean, props like that? Yeah, of, like. Occasionally, but not really. Like, yeah. you know, that's kind of more for like uh, Jamie Heineman and Adam Savage, they do that kind of stuff. I'm not in that world, so nobody would ask me to do a prop for a movie. I guess after seeing the making it. Actually, I did fun. get asked to do a prop for some Marvel movie, but when the guy told me the budget, I said, not doing that. 
I'm like, I'm not going to do it just simply because it's a Marvel movie. Right. Hollywood takes advantage of artists like in a huge way all the time. Like yeah. this guy thought I was going to jump all over making a prop for a Marvel movie. I said, no, I'll do it if you pay me tens of thousands of dollars. Like they come at you like, oh, it's for a Marvel movie. It's for this. It's for that. I'm like, okay. It means you have money. 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 But for me, you don't have money. Have you ever seen uh, Mr. Beast? Yeah. Like, okay. So he, he, have you seen his Willy Wonka one? I haven't seen it yet, but I watched. I started watching it, but I didn't. Uh, I was it. like, because I, it, I wanted to ask that because I'm like, I know you said you like Willy Wonka. Yeah. So. I, I like I like Mr. Beast. I think he's great. I don't I don't want to absorb his content. Oh, I might not wholeheartedly, be but I but I, I like what he's doing. I think he's I think what he's doing is great for so many young artists. Would you be, like? Because he's done like the Squid Games one and he's done Willy Wonka. Was that something you'd like love to like collaborate with and do something on ever? When I think of a collaboration, if it's something I could devote one or two days to, that's fine. Got it. When it turns into like weeks and months of setting up for Squid yeah. Games and picking the right color tracksuit that looks like the TV show, like that's, I'm too old for that. But you know, if you wanted one prop for me, like a chocolate toilet. That's what I mean, yeah. I might be able to do that. All right, so next part of this video is, we like to call it Make It in a Minute. Okay. So really what this is, is I'm going to fire off about eight to 10 questions. It's gonna be like lightning uh, round Q and A, just like three to four words, the first thing that comes to mind as I okay. do it. But while I'm doing it, you are going to have to make this oh. Lego Star Wars <laughs> Millennium Falcon as I'm asking you <laughs> questions. So I'll give you a moment to, uh, to check out. If you need the directions, then you can. We'll just see how far you can go. So here we go. Best friend a maker could have? Uh, somebody that uh, owns a materials or tool company. Mm -hmm. Favorite store, I see what you did there. Favorite store or resource center? For me right now is, is uh, I'm not gonna get too far with this damn thing. Uh, Albany Steel. An evening with tools or an evening with Tool the band? Uh, tool the band. Favorite streaming service? Uh, YouTube. Best vacation or visiting road trip spot? I like a road trip. Me and Taylor like a long road trip. Favorite showbiz personality not named Nick Offerman? Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I love comedians. Maybe, maybe lately Bill Burr. Oh, perfect. Spicy Mexican cuisine or spicy Asian cuisine? Uh, Mexican. Favorite YouTuber or content creator besides yourself? Uh, Colin Furs. So Chicago or New York pizza? Uh, New York pizza. Get the hell out of here. All right, we'll, we'll end it there. Hold on. Perfect. Watch you crash into the pile of parts. <laughs> Get the hell out of here with this thing. It's a funny idea. I think you need like five minutes. Okay. Maybe make <laughs> it in two minutes. Three is a good compromise. Okay. All right, so this is gonna be our gift to Jimmy. Uh, wrong side. Right, let's give this to Jimmy. All right, sir. So, we know you have pretty much probably every single one of our racks already, but you don't have... The Jimmy. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Yeah, so... Wow, are these, are these all the YouTube videos? Yeah. Wow, that is awesome, dude. Yeah, this looks pretty awesome. cool seeing all this stuff. Is this in like, most viewed order? I think it's... Yeah, because it looks familiar to me. <laughs> Obviously, like for us, it's cool that we have people out there that are using our product who are yeah. out in the world and, you know, starting YouTube channels or we know Adam Savage uses our stuff too. So yeah. for us, it was like, thank you. It's like dream come true for us to be able to like bring this to you and then you talk about it and we get to, you know, create all this cool content with you. For sure. But we got to know, you know, if you, if you remember, because I know sometimes it's just like this thing that happens in passing. What was your first experience with K&S? As a kid, every single time I went to a hardware store, I would see the, the spray. The and as I got older and hardware stores, real hardware stores, mom and pop shops began to close, yeah. <clears throat> began to stop seeing these. And as a kid, and then especially when I got into toy design, you really only would see them at hobby shops and then really nowhere else. There was a couple hobby shops on Long Island I would go to and I would find the tubes and to find the tubes and the telescoping tubes and the various mm -hmm. different they were becoming increasingly more difficult to find. I picked up the phone and started looking up your name. <laughs> and I wrote out to somebody and I said, can I buy my own rack for my shop? And they said, sure. And actually, coincidentally, like a couple days previous to that, maybe a week or two or a month before that, Adam Savage had reached out and got his own rack. So I thought I was 
being groundbreaking. <laughs> I didn't know that Adam had gotten there before me. I was a little upset to see that he'd made it there before me. Adam. But, <laughs> damn. <laughs> so, no, I, I said, instead of me trying to find these in the stores, I just wanted my whole own rack. Yep. So it was about, I guess, two years ago that I bought a rack and then I think, I think I bought a second one and then you guys did a little bit of follow up on me and then you sent me one, thankfully. And then I kind of didn't notice you guys in the, in the social media game at the it's time. fairly recent. Yeah, yeah so then you, I think you guys, I don't know if I helped you. I don't know if I helped you with that. Oh, believe me, it helped. But for me, it solves so many problems just to have yeah. all different thicknesses, sizes, different girths and tubes and lengths. And so, you know, if, if we need like a, something for a carburetor or for something for a linkage or whatever. Is there anything specific that you use the most on? Well, on the big rack you gave me, I use this, there's a couple of rods of spring steel. Yep. I use the spring steel a lot. Always the brass tubes, but occasionally the aluminum tubes are good because they, they break, so do the brass, but the easy way to, you know the easy way to cut those with a razor blade? If you get a perfect cut with a razor blade, it should, it should work, we'll see. Heck yeah. That is a solid, perfect cut. Yes, it is. Have you ever seen that before? Let's, uh, let's head over to my favorite, I think, part of this, even though it's not the, not officially Ghostbusters, right? But it, no, it's, 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 it's inspired. Years, it's two years older than the Ghostbusters car. So this is a 59? The, no, 59 is the Ghostbusters. This is a 57. Oh, got it. Okay. Yeah, so this is backwards. two years older than what would be a Ghostbusters car. This is a 1957 Superior Cadillac. Hearst, Superior is the company in Pennsylvania that would have made it. They get like a Sedan DeVille and then they turn it into this. So they get like, sometimes they get just the front half of a car yeah. on a frame and then they take it and they build the back half. And this is a 1957 Hearst. I bought this last summer thinking we were going to do season two of Making Fun. And we were going to do a Halloween episode. Oh man. And it was a good deal that came across and I was like, you know what? Why the hell not? I just recently offered it up for trade to whoever has something cool to trade to me. Okay. So we'll see, who knows. Wow, even complete with a <laughs> gurney. Yeah. Yeah, the, the one thing I love about this car is that it, it's just so well kept. Yeah. It's been so well preserved. It was outside for a few minutes because I needed the space in here, but I just recently <laughs> brought it back inside. It doesn't deserve to be in the weather. No. I am now, I am now like the steward of this car and I wanna make sure. Well, especially if you're trading it for, yeah. you know, but yeah, so given that the, the, we had an Instagram user that, that actually uh, asked this, what is your most recent collection that you started and what do you want to start collecting? Well, I started collecting a couple years ago. I have Chevy trucks. I mean, I got maybe four or five. I forgot, I lost count. And then the backhoe, which is the recent edition. I got that about a year ago. Anything out there? whether it's car related or not, is there like a certain thing you're like, I need this as my, um, I'll drop everything I'm doing for this. That's a good question. You know, I have a bandsaw collection. I have a lot of printing press stuff. I have, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but I have a lot of weird Is there anything you wish you could do or that you're going to be working on or like, I want to get a little bit better at that? I guess, uh, you know, uh, going forward, uh, I want to get more involved in casting metal or brass. I've done it a little bit, but I want to do it a little bit more. What is coming up next for you that you're excited about? Could be professionally, could be we personally. We have conversations about a new show, uh, a show where people show up their skill set, and I'll be like the host. Nice. Potentially. You know, what you've done is inspired others um, to do so many things and inspired us to do this, and, you know, as somebody who's appreciator of YouTubers and, and people that go out and get it themselves. Again, I'm a musician, so I've seen many people that have had to say, screw you to the record labels and all that stuff. You know, that's exactly what you did. You said, I'm gonna do it myself. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of people that appreciate that and just love your content. So yeah. for us, it's been, a, it's been a pleasure to do this and we're looking forward to the next adventures as well. So there you have it. Our first episode is in the books. This is Jimmy DeResta. Thank you. The inaugural episode of KS Creators Collective. We had to get Jimmy for this because. Thank you very much. Hey, who better to get than Jimmy DeResta? Once again, Thanks, we man. appreciate you. Thank you so much. Let's uh, ride off into the sunset here. Let's go get a sandwich. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this type of content, then please subscribe to our channel as well as pressing the notification bell so that you stay up to date on when new videos release.